Good morning, and welcome to worship on this 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We are glad that you have decided to join us for worship this morning at Lutheran Church of the Ascension. We wish you could be with us here in person, but are grateful for this online format that allows us to gather even though we can't be together in person. As we prepare for worship this morning, I remind you or invite you to uh, prepare the elements for Holy Communion if it's your desire to participate in communion later in the worship service with us, for this is a service of Holy Communion. Friends, we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. God. In, in your, your compassion, compassion, forgive us our sins, sins known and unknown, things, things done and left undone. undone. Uphold us, us by your spirit, spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To, to the, the honor, honor and glory, glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
He is indeed exalted. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And And also also with you. Let us pray. O God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example, point us to the path of obedience, and give us strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. A reading from Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, and begins with the 21st verse. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Well, before we get started, I've been having some problems this morning. I was trying to get on my phone to check some things, and it just won't work. I'm pushing the screen, I'm pushing the buttons on the side, and I just can't get this thing to work. If you guys have any ideas on how to get this thing to work, I just can't. Oh, that's right. I had it upside down. It's not going to work right in the back. So today we're talking about Peter, and he gets a little turned around. Um, He forgets his job. Jesus is the leader, and he's the follower, and he kind of gets turned around. So 
what game could we play? Oh, can we play follow the leader? I know it's going to be kind of different today because you're not here with me, but I can do something and you can follow along at home. Should we try it? So maybe put your hands up like this, or maybe you can spin around. Maybe you can jump. Maybe you can walk in a circle. Maybe we can try to touch our feet. I, I don't think I can quite do that. Maybe we can bend down. Maybe we can touch our nose. Maybe we can rub our bellies. Kind of silly things. But let's talk about it. Is it hard to follow someone sometimes? Is it always easy to follow someone? I give you kind of easy things to do, but sometimes it can be hard to follow somebody. And what does it mean to follow someone? You have to follow, have a leader first, right? And who's our leader as Christians? Jesus, right? And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think we have a better idea and we want to do what we want to do. And is that what we're supposed to do as Christians? Are we supposed to do what we want to do? Or are we supposed to follow what Jesus wants us to do? We're supposed to follow Jesus. And guess what? Is that always easy? No, it's not always easy. But there's one thing. Did we choose to be Christians? Or were we forced to be Christians? We chose, right? And because we chose to be Christians, we chose to follow Jesus. And we need to try to do what Jesus wants us to do and love others. And that's not always easy. And it's not, everybody's not going to always like what we believe. But we chose to believe in Jesus. And so we need to follow what Jesus wants us to do. So can we remember that this week? as we go through our weeks, and can you guys pray responsibly with me? Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you for our leader Jesus. Help us to not get in his way. Help us to follow him, even when it's hard. Amen. Amen. I just need a minute. I didn't know Mr. Justin was going to have us working out during the children's message. I was trying to catch my breath. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly we can all remember the golden age of the televangelist. And I'm not talking about since COVID started. But back when televangelism started... I don't recall its beginnings because they predate me, but I did a little research and I've read about Fulton J. Sheen, a Roman Catholic archbishop who successfully transitioned from a weekly radio broadcast onto the big screen, well, the television screen, black and white, it would have been small in 1951 when he did it. Sheen went, then went on to win numerous enemy awards for his televised preaching and teaching throughout the 50s and into the late 60s. In 1947, Oral Roberts put together the largest television broadcast at the time, reaching 80% of the possible television viewing, viewing population. In the 60s and 70s, Billy Graham utilized the radio, the television, and his infamous crusades to reach people with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the late 70s and into the 80s, televangelists were invited into the political arena as President Reagan aligned himself with what became the Christian Coalition voting bloc. Evangelical televangelists such as Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell were invited to political functions, and they began to use their growing popularity to further their ministries, their influence, and their financial status. In the 80s, we, were, we experienced a cacophony of voices preaching, teaching, yelling, and singing on the television. Jimmy Swaggart was preaching. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were crying. Oral Roberts was healing. The, the programs became longer and they were aired more often. There was a time when even though there were less than a dozen channels being broadcast into our homes, it was difficult to turn on the TV and not find somebody preaching somewhere on the airwaves. Then almost as quickly as they rose, they fell. 
In January of 1987, during a fundraising drive, Oral Roberts announced to a television audience that unless he raised $8 million, he was going to, God would call him home. Now, his audience, his, his <clears throat> followers, assumed that his impassioned pleas for this money for fear that God was going to call him home was, was referring to suicide, that if he didn't get the $8 million that he believed God was calling him to raise, and as a result, they raised $9.1 million. When Roberts eventually did die, not of suicide, his, one of his obituary, obituaries mentioned his love of Italian silk suits, diamond rings, and gold bracelets that were airbrushed out of publicity pictures by his staff. Later in 1987, the ministry of Jim and Tammy Faye Baker came crashing to a halt when it was revealed that Baker and his PTL associates had been selling $1,000 lifetime memberships, which entitled, entitled buyers to an annual three-night stay in a luxury hotel at Heritage USA. Tens of thousands of these memberships were sold, but they only built a 500-room hotel. And by selling more memberships than they could accommodate, they raised more than twice enough to build the promised hotel that never got built. Some of the additional funds that were, used, that were raised were used to silence Jessica Hahn, a secretary at Baker's Church, with whom he had an affair. In 19... 88, Baker was found guilty on 24 counts of fraud. Also in 1988, a private investigator found that Jimmy Swaggart had solicited a prostitute, which led to his famous I Have Sinned sermon in February of that year, where he confessed his transgressions and asked for forgiveness, but his ministry never recovered. In these two brief years, these three men who had had very large followings of dedicated, loyal Christian women and men went from being the rocks upon which their ministries were built to a stumbling block. They very quickly fell from the foundation upon which they preached, and they became a stumbling block not only to those who followed their teaching, but also to the ministry of the entire Christian church. And unfortunately, there are many, many, many more examples of men and women who at one time had been a pillar of the church, maybe even a cornerstone, who quickly became a stumbling block to the gospel. Unfortunately, not all their stories have made national news. This morning's gospel reading tells a similar story. At least the stumbling block part of the story. But if you were with us last Sunday, you're familiar with the entire story, which is, involves Jesus' interaction with Peter. Last week we read that first half that, that takes place in, when Jesus and the disciples are in Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answer, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. To which Jesus replied, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter boldly proclaims, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In response, Jesus blessed Simon and acknowledged that, that his faith in him was a gift from God, given to him by God, not of, of any human endeavor. Jesus then called Simon Petra, or Peter, which means rock. And then he said, on this rock, meaning Peter's faith, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so it is well before Pentecost, well before the crucifixion, that Jesus establishes his church with the faith of Peter as its cornerstone. And it's from that time on that our gospel reading begins this morning with the second half of that story. Jesus begins to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great sufferings. He doesn't just tell the disciples. We read that he shows them much like he has been doing throughout his ministry and his time with them. You see, Jesus' whole life and ministry has brought him and the disciples to this point and to this place so that they might together journey to Jerusalem. And with that being said, Jesus' words would have been hard for the disciples to take because they don't make sense and they aren't what the disciples wanted to hear. After he has suffered at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, he says, 
He will be killed and on the third day raised. Can you imagine such a thing? Have you ever heard of such a thing, something that doesn't commute, something that seems like pure nonsense? It seems like every day we're hearing pure nonsense these days. Anyway, for Peter, Jesus' revelation is beyond comprehension. Not only is Jesus his teacher and his friend, but he had also just given Peter the metaphorical keys to the kingdom. It didn't make sense. If Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the long-promised Messiah, why would he have to endure suffering and death at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes? Peter, the rock, with keys in his hands, responds to what Jesus has said with passion and conviction. God forbid it. This must never happen. And as quickly as Peter stood upon that rock... Jesus knocks him down. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says. Can you imagine a more hurtful accusation? Jesus had just told Peter that he had received a special revelation from God about Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Jesus had just called him Petra, announcing his faith as the rock upon which he will build his church. And he has figuratively given him the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And as quickly as Peter ascended onto the top of that rock, he descended even quicker. In an instant, Peter went from being the rock to being the stumbling block. Oh, how the mighty have fallen yet again. Jesus accuses Peter of setting his mind on human things, not divine things. Sounds like a similar refrain, doesn't it? Is that not what happened in these three examples that I mentioned earlier? These men became focused on human things, sex, money, power, and they lost sight of the divine things. That is the good news of God's gracious love for us, which is offered to each and every one of us through the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah, the Son of the living God, God's one and only Son given for you and for me. You see how quickly these men and Peter went from being on the rock to becoming the stumbling block? You see, the temptation to allow our minds to shift from divine things to human things can be intoxicating and blinding. Quite often, we don't even realize that it has happened because it comes so naturally and it feels so good. Those of us in vocational ministry, I think, provide some of the most obvious examples of this. When I receive positive feedback from a sermon that I've preached or a Bible study that I've read or a newsletter article that I've written, it feels good. Such kind words are encouraging. They sustain me when I'm not feeling confident or competent in ministry. However, when I become more aware or concerned about receiving positive feedback from my preaching, teaching, and writing, if I become more concerned about that than I am about the content of the message that I am stri striving to convey, then, then I am setting my mind on human things and not divine things, like God's word that I've been called to preach and teach. You see, if I am more concerned about whether you like me and think I'm a good preacher than I am about what the text intends to teach, both you and, then, and me, then I have become a stumbling block. Does that make sense? The same thing ha can happen to any of, uh, any of us. It doesn't just happen to rostered ministers. It can happen to anybody who desires to follow Jesus. When our motivation is not the message of the gospel, which in this passage is about taking up our cross and following Jesus, when we set our minds upon human things, not divine things, we become a stumbling block. Then we are like Peter and these men that I've already mentioned. However, when we die to ourselves, which is when we release, which is a release of our human wants and desires, and we allow ourselves to be raised in Christ through the waters of holy baptism, it's then that we gain our lives. We become or are in the process of becoming imitators of Christ. Jesus invites Peter, the disciples, and us to take up our cross and follow him, knowing full well that he is headed to Jerusalem 
to give up his life for us all. As his followers, what do you suppose he is asking of us? If he invites us to follow where he is going, what could he possibly be asking of us? Friends, we are invited to give up our lives for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of God's love for us and for all creation. And in so doing, we are given new life, everlasting life in him. The logic might be difficult to follow from our human perspective, but from God's loving perspective, this is the plan to restore our relationship with our creator, to die to self so that we might be raised by God, with God, in God, so that our lives might become a reflection of the divine, not because of anything that we have done, but because of what God through Christ has done for us. Now this is a place where Peter and many of us get confused. Having received the gift of God's love, the acclamation and the promise that God is going to do something in us and through us, we assume that we are invincible and that we know all the answers. Friends, Peter argued with Jesus, argued with Jesus about his need to go to Jerusalem and be tortured and killed and three days later raised. Peter was likely feeling pretty good after Jesus' affirmation of his faith. And Jesus had to correct him, had to put him back in his lane. Jesus told Peter to get behind him. Because this is a place for a disciple. From there, Peter and the others can pick up their crosses and follow. Jesus doesn't discard Peter. He doesn't just send him off somewhere else. He says, no. Get behind me where followers go. For Peter, you thought perhaps you were Messiah and you had the answers. But no, you are a disciple. You are a follower of the the Messiah. Come with me. Come with me. Friends, the same is true for us. Luther describes it this way, this relationship between being the rock and the stumbling block. Luther describes it as, as simul justus et pacator. We are simultaneously saint and sinner. <laughs> the distance from being the rock and the stumbling block is not far. Both always coexist. For we are constantly being forgiven by God and we are constantly needing forgiveness. And the same is true of Peter. He thought that by having been praised for his faith and acknowledged for, for the depth of his faith that he could could move into into a new place. He forgot that he is human and not divine, not God. And that's where we find ourselves. As followers of Jesus, we struggle to stay upon the rock rather than becoming the stumbling block. As we strive to maintain our gaze upon the divine instead of the human things. Friends, that's why we come to the table We come to the table where the divine and the human intersect, where we are given a glimpse of the heavenly as we partake of the one who is both fully human and fully divine. For it's at the table that we acknowledge our sinfulness, our stumbling blockness, so the foundation of our faith and our relationship with God might be restored. So let us boldly go where God is calling us to to go, following him, taking up our cross, and sharing the good news of the gospel, not perfectly, but faithfully, in acknowledgement and thanksgiving for God's love for us. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your church on divine things. Grant us trust in you that we lose our lives for the sake of Christ and thereby discover joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world as you do. As the seasons change, pattern the rhythm of our lives in harmony with all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your creation groans with pain from the fires that are consuming it. Keep those fighting the fires safe. Sustain those who have experienced loss. And keep us all mindful of how we can care for those who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, you call us to live peaceably with all. Give us ears to hear one another even those we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding that they advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promise to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain, raise the spirits of those who are despairing, and heal the sick. We especially pray for Rosie Inglesgard, and for whom else do the people of God pray? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. Help us overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I encourage you to share signs of that peace with those who are gathered with and worship. Having done that, we transition to the time of offering for during our worship service. And we give you thanks for the gifts that have already been received in the church office and those that have been, will be sent in electronically as well as through the mail. And during the singing of the offering song, I invite you to prepare your communion table as we prepare ours.
The Lord be with you. And, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to give our, our thanks and praise. praise. And it is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And great love you sent to us, Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant to my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We are gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, so let us together pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For those who are Worshiping with others, I invite you to serve one another. But if you're worshiping by yourself with us, I invite you to partake as I do as well. The body of Christ broken for you and for me. The blood of Christ shed for the sins of the world. Amen. Amen. And blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Strengthen and preserve you in the true faith. In the name of the Father, 
and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, and may the Lord of peace go with you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of this welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. We respond to God's word by hearing the announcements and ways that we can gather and respond in our lives throughout the week and weeks ahead. I just... For your information's sake, know that uh, Ascension Christian Preschool begins a new school year tomorrow. Uh, they have uh, been here throughout the summer providing um, daycare and preschool instruction, but a new year of instruction begins tomorrow in person here. We will meet on Tuesday morning via Zoom for text talk. If you are not receiving that a Zoom meeting invitation and would like to, please contact the church office and we'll be sure to get that to you. Our, our gathering on Tuesday evenings for prayer continues and we'll be sending out uh, this Tuesday evening's prayers um, sometime before 7 o'clock on Tuesday, likely by the end of the day, Monday. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we invite you to join us in this space again um, through live stream, Facebook, live for a service of lament. What is a service of lament? It's an opportunity for us to gather, um, to, to grieve the things that we have lost and the things that we miss during this time of, of distancing and not being able to gather in person, the, the trips we've had to cancel, the, the, the lives that have been lost that we haven't been able to gather together in person to, to grieve and to give thanks for. An opportunity for us to lift up our prayers to God, saying how long, and, and acknowledge the challenges that we're facing, and then also acknowledge that God is faithful and ever-present with us and among us. So that service is Wednesday, this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday morning during our worship service, we'll do a back-to-school blessing for, for students who are returning to school. We're not inviting you here in person for that, but we invite you here on, on Facebook Live for that. And uh, as part of that blessing will be some care packages for our students that will get delivered out to them during the week. Um, friends, we cannot thank you enough for your generosity in helping pay down our loan balance. Gifts have been coming in this month, and their, their total, I don't know, but as of our last payment um, at the beginning of the month, our loan balance is down to $9,200. And so in basically little less than two years, we've reduced that um, loan um, down to less than $10,000 from the $120,000 it began. So thank you for your generosity. This week, uh, if you have school-aged or Sunday school-aged children, they should have received a copy of the children's worship bulletin that coincided with our, the texts read in worship today. Uh, you, your students, your children should be receiving those every week um, going forward now as a piece of mail coming from the church, an opportunity for them to gather, um, whether it's during the worship service or some other time, to uh, do the activities there and uh, reflect on the texts that we'll be preaching on um, in lieu of gathering for Sunday school since we're unable to do that these days. In two weeks uh, is Sunday, this September 13th, which is God's Work Our Hands Sunday. And traditionally we have gone to the food bank and, and done a service project. This year we are going to do our God's Work Our Hands service projects individually at our homes. And so now we have a, a video um, that uh, Rich has put together to describe that. God's Work Our Hand Sunday will be held this year on September 13th. Unlike prior years when we've held service projects at food banks that weekend, this year we're going to hold a remote service project due to COVID-19. We're asking your family to build blessing bags at home using items that you purchased. Watch Ascension's emails and website for a list of suggested items to include. 
Your blessing bag should be delivered to Ascension between Monday, September 14th and Wednesday, September 16th. There will be a collection box on the back patio near the north entrance. Your blessing bags will be delivered to nonprofit organizations that serve the poor and the hungry in our community. Thank you for your support. So the question on all of our minds is, how did Rich get all the food to not slide off the counter at an angle like that? Anyway, thanks, Rich. And uh, hopefully, we used to talk about hanging signs in my previous work life, hanging signs slightly askew that would bug people, and then they might actually read them. So we'll pretend like we played that video sideways to draw your attention to what Rich was saying. Um, and I'm... Someday, I'm sure we'll figure out how to get it upright. Not, not the me of we, but the more collective. But, um, I guess that's it for announcements. Hard to, hard to follow that. But let us demonstrate our unity in Christ by praying together the prayer for unity. Almighty God, your son Jesus prayed that his followers might be one. Make us one with him as he is one with you so that in peace and unity, not uniformity, we may share the message of your love with one another and the community through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now receive the blessing. May the blessing of Almighty God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and of Christ Jesus who summons us to service, and the Holy Spirit who inspires generosity and love, remain with us always. Amen. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.
the key.